You don't know how blessed you are, we are, as a congregation for the kind of musical talent that God has brought to this congregation. Uh, it is a gift. And I know that in many congregations, uh, the idea of combining uh, types of music is a little disconcerting for some. Uh, congregations fight over issues around music. But because I see God in a variety of ways, and God reveals to humankind in a variety of ways, music should be expressed in a variety of ways. In funkier, noisier, hip-hopish church music. Or calm, cool, and collected tunes that have profound theological meaning in our lives. So we are truly, truly blessed. And if they can hear us, I'd love us to give our musicians another round of applause. This morning, I'd like to bring a few words of hope and encouragement to your faith. Uh, from the Word of God. Let's read the lesson for this morning found in Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 to 17. And we're reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. And I'll read it from here. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants, with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you. Capture that thought for a moment. The birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth, God said. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow or rainbow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and, and the bow rainbow is seen in in the clouds i will remember my covenant that is between me and you and then look at what the writer says every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh when the bow or the rainbow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that it is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. There are in the Bible, I think I may have said that on a number of occasions, or maybe once here, because I usually will say it, or you know that I've served in nine different congregations in my 30 years of ministry, and Served 25 years as a chaplain, both on active and reserve duty for 25 of those years. And I am sure that I said this when I was preaching and had the opportunity to preach, whether in a desert in Iraq or aboard an aircraft carrier or a small boy or to a bunch of 
rowdy marines. There are a number of perplexing verses in the Bibles and stories in the Bible. The Bible is full of these perplexing stories. You know, stories that you just sort of like, if you're a postmodern kind of folk, you, you scratch your head. You wonder where, why it's, is it even in the Bible? There are a number of those. But perhaps one of the most perplexing one of all is really chapters 1 to chapters 11 of the book of Genesis. For me, therein lies a number of things that sort of just... When I read them when I was younger in my faith, I, I would scratch my head and I would wonder, was this really true? Chapter 1 to chapter 11 of the book of Genesis. If you've been around church long enough, you know that, that these stories pretty well. That, that these stories have been around for a long time. You remember them in sermons that your pastors have shared, that others have shared in Sunday schools and Bible studies. Let me enumerate to refresh our memory a little bit or some of these stories in these first 11 chapters. They're very important. They're key to understanding a lot of deeper theological truths that lie within. For example, the first two chapters of Genesis start with two stories of creation, not one. There are two. Two versions of the creation narratives in the first two chapters. Then the story of the fall and failure of our primordial parents, Adam and Eve. The murder of Abel by Cain, narratives on the wickedness of the nations and generations that followed. The narratives about a man named Noah and an ark and his family and the animals of all kind. And then an eventual flood, global flood. And God's then covenanting with Noah that God would never destroy the earth by waters and floods. The other narratives in first 11 chapters include stories about the new start of a new generation of peoples as descendants of the sons of Noah. And probably the most fascinating one for me is the appearance of a tower of Babel and the mass confusion of a people by a variety of language which rendered them unable to communicate with one another. So much so, they actually left the city, scattered throughout the world, and here we are today. Clearly, from the perspective of modern biblical scholars, these stories share many features in common with, with some degree of originality, keep that in mind, with some minor degree or a lot of the typical ancient Near Eastern literature of a few thousand years ago. Zaida, my wife, who's a theologian, could probably expand on that even further. Yet for Christians who view these stories literally, they're real stories. They actually happened literally several thousand years ago. They are stories that explain how we came to be, the nature of who we are, especially the nature of our relationship to something called sin, and even why there are a thousand or thousands of different languages and dialects in the world. On the other hand, for Christians who view these stories not as literal events, they see these stories as theological truths to live by. So you have a choice to make. They're stories of God yearning for relationship with us. They're narratives about the nature of our ability to fail God and one another. And they're tales about arrogance and fear and jealousy and not so pretty behavior along the way. They're ancient novelas, as we would use in the Spanish version of the more modern novelas so common in the Spanish-speaking world. 
or the equivalents of the modern general hospitals soap operas of long ago and are they still around? I don't know. These are attempts to explain the incomprehensible matters peoples long ago tried to understand. Their ways and means by which humans have tried their best, our best, to understand the world around us and the very nature of God and our relationship to that creating God. So whatever route you take as a Christian to try to decipher these stories, I tend to be sort of a centrist. I, I look at the middle of the road. I look at possibilities of one versus the other, but I'm also a rationalist and I understand that reason and faith are incredible partners of loving God and loving one another. One thing is clear, though. I don't want you to misunderstand something in this message. is clear. These stories must be read and understood as our stories. They belong to us. Don't run away from them. Don't avoid them. Read them and let them speak to you as the Spirit gives utterance. They're the words of God from which God speaks to us to make us whole, to live as hopeful people, faithful people, filled people to the brim of our spiritual coffee cup. To remind us, as always, that, 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 that God is somehow engaged in the written word of God. And that, as I've said on many occasions as a pastor, you and I are not the center of the universe. These stories compel believers to see God's relationship to us and to make an attempt to love God and to serve our Redeemer. The reading for today is the final episode of the story of Noah and his family, and Noah's Ark, and a flood, and the restart of a whole new world. At the end of the flood stories, God makes a solemn promise to Noah, in which God states on two separate occasions that God would never again, never again destroy humankind and the earth by Flood and waters, like what is read in this chapter of Genesis. Hold that phrase for a moment. I'm going to be back to it in about three more minutes. That is, never again. To me, one of the most fascinating parts of the promise that God makes to Noah and all humankind in this Bible story is, is, is the promise that God makes to Noah and his family, but not just to Noah and his family. All humankind, the earth, and every living creature in it. It's as if God is telling Noah, saying to Noah and his descendants, that God's love for God's creation is so deep, so wide, so broad, that it's unfathomable. It is overcovering. That God's love endures forever for all generations, for all of God's people, no matter who you are and where you are on life's journey. But not just you and me, planet Earth and all that is within it, oh my. What a reminder to us today to have a responsibility of not only honoring the God of creation, but that we have a responsibility to all the creatures on earth, including earth itself. Not only am I my brother and my sister's keeper, we all know that, but also the brother and sister's keeper of planet earth. It's a lesson that reminds us that God is that first divine environmentalist, that we have a responsibility to the earth and all that is within it for us and for our future generations. That's what our brother who was sharing that announcement 
was trying to encourage us and remind us. That's what in the children's sermon, our beautiful children's teacher, pastor, was teaching my little beautiful granddaughter that we have a responsibility to the earth and whatever small thing we can do to extend it, we're not extending it just for ourselves, we're extending it to your children and your children's children and their children as well. But notice again that I alluded that this promise is reiterated twice on both occasions and in both occasions God uses the phrase never again, nunca jamás in Spanish, never again, nunca jamás. Never again, never again would God destroy humankind by a universal flood. Never again. And that would be a covenant, a divine promise that would have no expiration date. Never again. All right, preacher, so what does this mean for us today? I'm glad you asked. Do you have any never agains in your life? Do you? Have you promised to God, covenanted with God, or someone you love deeply to never again? In fact, we all should have a few of those. I mean, after all, we, we're humans, we do make mistakes. Uh, at least I think so. And I'm sure we've had an occasion or two where we've failed, failed miserably. Someone we love, someone you love, and you promise to never do it again. Of course, we all have. In fact, I hope you do, as I have too. I have a few never agains that I vow to the people I love, to the neighbors I love, to the world I love, to the nation I love, to the people I love, to the world around me that I love. Let me mention a few of those to jot your memory. By doing so, maybe, just maybe, they'll remind us of our vows that we've made around this thing of never again. Never again will I, will I, with careless disregard, minimize the humanity of my wife. I'm coming up to 42 years of marriage in May. To that beautiful thing right there. Lord, no, I ain't perfect. All you got to do is, is, if you want to know how perfect or imperfect someone is, you got two categories of folk you can ask. Ask the wife or spouse. Uh, and then ask the kids. <laughs> the kids will tell you the truth. <laughs> How many times have I said to that, honey, I'll never do that again? Countless. Never again will I allow myself to hurt and minimize with malice of heart the humanity of a member of the flocks that I've ever served and the sacred places in which I call my spiritual home, this being one of them. Never again will I allow myself to be a quiet participant of another holocaust or ethnic cleansing anywhere in the world to the best of my ability, whether, there's, whether it's the Burmese military junta's genocide of the Rohingya people or Putin's invasion and destruction of Ukraine. Never again, never again will, will I allow someone to physically harm a child in front of my eyes. I'll give my life. Never again. Never again will I remain quiet when someone uses a demeaning racial, homophobic, or sexist joke around me. Never again. When I was serving with Marines, which was half of my military ministry, they know I did not tolerate that. And as soon as I walked in, with the chaplaincy. 
some may call that woke, associated with cancel culture. But you know what I call it? I call it respect and honoring the other as a child of God. Never again. Never again will I allow myself to fall in that ugly trap. Never again will I be silent by anyone in positions of power to speak the truth to power. I refuse. I've had on more than one occasion, a few folk tell me, Pastor, I think you were a little too political. Never again. Never again will I allow myself to carelessly hurt my friends or my enemies. Oh gosh, I know that's hard. But if there's anything that I've learned in 30 years of ministry, both congregational and military ministry, is that words matter. Are you with me? Yes, I have the liberty. I have the right of free speech. But I don't have the right to hurt my brother and my sister. I don't. Words do matter. Words can destroy the weak or lift up the weak. Never again will I refuse to tell men and women equally to love their spouses as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. Never again. And never again will I be afraid to invite men and women to a relationship to Jesus Christ in their lives. Never again. Okay, so let me ask you, what's your never again? What's your never again? What's your never again?